G'day everyone, I'm Barney and today we're going to be making a game or at least starting one and like every self-respecting programmer I have a pile, a pile I tell you of unfinished projects, most of them games that are never going to see the light of day but today that changes, today I'm going to start a new game and I will finish it and I'm bringing you down with me, <laughs> I mean uh, I'll bring you along for the, uh, for the journey. Outside of a professional environment, I've never actually taken something from a prototype all the way up to a release. So I would love to actually publish something and I would love to gain that sweet experience that comes with that whole cycle of events. And if I end up tossing this game on that pile with all of the other projects, you have permission to tell me to throw myself on the trash heap as well. Now we've got the pleasantries out of the way. What is this game actually going to be about? So I went digging through the pile of trash here and I found this little gem from 2017. So basically you can walk around this little planet and and that's pretty much it. But it got the brains inside the brains. There's nothing in there. But it got the little cogs inside my brain to be spinning. So you basically just hop from asteroid to asteroid, mining them for resources. And that's really good because it'll keep the mega corporation that you're enslaved by happy. And you use different tools on each of these asteroids, but you only get a certain number of tools for each asteroid you actually visit. So you got to be careful in how you deploy them so that you can maximize your profits. You'll then be able to use these profits to upgrade your tools so that you can make even more money. Let's go. We've just invented capitalism. Oh, and instead of using pickaxes, we'll be using using bombs, so that's uh, that's good. The asteroids are gonna have lots of different layers all the way down to the core, which if you can get to it, is gonna be worth a lot of money. There's also gonna be precious resources scattered around the place that will give you a little boost of income as well. And that's as complicated as the asteroid generation is gonna get for the moment, but in the future, I'm planning to add things like tunnels and proper veins of precious ores. As you progress through the game, the asteroids are going to be made out of harder materials, but they'll be richer in resources. So if you've been strategic and upgraded your tools well, you'll be treated to the rewards. So the asteroid and the asteroid belts that we're going to be traveling through are going to be randomly generated and there will be permadeaths, which means this is like kind of a roguelike like game. And then the tools that we upgrade and collect and use are going to be loosely based on the mechanics from a deck builder. So it kind of fits into that genre as well. But I don't think this game is actually going to be like perfectly fitting into deck building or into roguelikes as you'll see. By the way, while you're watching this, if you come up with a good idea for the name for this game, please let me know because I have no idea what to call it. All right, let me know in the comments. Just got to take my Ugg boots off. So now let's get into the actual nitty gritty of this project. So I'm going to be using Java and I know it's probably not the most sane choice, but I'm familiar with it and I feel like it's much more realistic that I'm actually going to finish this thing if I'm not also trying to learn a new engine or a new language at the same time. So let me know in the comments why this is such a terrible idea and I'll just like shoot them straight to Notch and he can deal with your complaints. For the graphics side of thing, I'm... Things... Things plural. There is more than one thing. For the graphics side of things, I'm going to be using processing, which depending on how you set it up, uses OpenGL under the hood. Barney, I hear you cry. Why the bloody heck would you do that? Again, it's because I'm familiar with it and I've actually used this exact technique in the past with my mates to create a game called Unexpected Orcs, which is a pretty big game, but in a surprise to no one, it never got released. So you can use processing as a library inside Java, which lets you do all of the normal Java things, as well as giving you really easy and quick access to a graphics API. And then you can dig down into the OpenGL if you need to. And little spoiler alert, I needed to. I'll leave a link in the description that goes into detail into how you can actually use processing in a library. So if you're keen to figure that out for yourself, look in the description. So I'm sort of breezing over all of the technical stuff in this devlog, but if there's anything you want to see in more depth, let me know in the comments and I'll make a tutorial on it. So now we've got that boring stuff out of the way, let's turn our attention to the actual game. The first thing I did was get the basics set up. I generated a little world here and I made the player that could fly around it and destroy the asteroid and collide with it. Is sort of. To make mining possible, we need destructible terrain. And I had the bright idea of doing this on a per pixel level. Uh, I'll get into the details on how that all works a bit later. But for now, all you need to know is that the terrain data is actually stored in an image, which is a bit of a pain in the ass when it comes to collisions. That's not the only bramble in my bottom when it comes to collision detection. I'm also using polar coordinates, you cheeky bugger. So usually your player would have an X and a Y coordinate. And if you're a frisky little freak and you're flirting with the third dimension, you can chuck a Z in there as well. And this is Cartesian coordinates. And that's very much the standard. So instead of an X and a Y, everything in my world has a distance from the center of the world, which is the radius, and then a rotation around that center point as well, which is the angle. And this makes everything a little bit trickier, or at least it does for me with my tiny little bird brain. 
what I ended up doing was casting a ray up and down from the player's position to see if it hits the terrain at all while it's moving along its radius direction, which is up and down. And that all seemed to work well, but it still left me with rotation to sort out. And for this, what I did was I just simply checked points on either side of the player and stop allowing the rotation in a given direction if that point is hitting the terrain. And these points are shifted up slightly from the ground, which allows the player to walk up slight inclines. Now, this may seem very janky to you, and I'll be honest, it kind of is, but all I need it to do is stop you from clipping through walls. I don't need really crisp collision detection. And so I think for the moment, it's good enough. So collision detection is pretty much solved and we'll never have to touch it ever again, I'm sure. Which means we can move on to the meat and potatoes of this thing, which is the pixel-based destructible terrain. Like I mentioned earlier, the way I get this to work is to store the information about the terrain inside an image where each pixel is essentially a block in my world. And I store all the information about that block in the pixels red, green, and blue channels. In the red channel, we store the material ID, which means we can have 256 different material types. The green channel holds how durable that material is. So some will be harder to break than others. Blue holds the health of the block. And then lastly, in the alpha channel, we just store whether or not it is solid. So if you're at all confused about what's in the different color channels, just remember this easy little chant. R stands for resource ID. G stands for good golly, how hard is that? And B stands for bloody heck, that hurt. When we're generating an asteroid, we're actually making this beautiful blue beast here. Now, the reason it's blue is because when we start out, all of the blocks have maximum health, which means that their blue channel is maxed out. And then the resource ID and the durability at the moment are quite low. So red and green are right down, which means we get blue. Obviously this blue thing doesn't look so good. So we've got to pass it through a shader to make it look <coughs> beautiful uh, <laughs> before we display it on the screen. So this shader looks at the red channel of a block to figure out which material texture to apply. And then it looks at the blue channel and it overlays a damage texture based on how much health that block has left. So there's definitely still a few bugs with this, but I fixed this in the next devlog. So definitely subscribe to see when that comes out. As you can tell, uh, art is not my strong suit, but I'm guessing you already knew that because if you've seen any of my tutorials, most of them are just like a white background with a, a red circle in the middle. But in the future, all of these textures will get an overhaul. Uh, but for the moment, you're going to have to suffer through my program art, I'm afraid. So that's the general gist on how the terrain information is stored. But how do we actually destroy the terrain? The way I got this to work is I draw the shape of the damage I want to cause the terrain on another texture. And the strength of the attack is dictated by the brightness of the pixels in the texture. The attack texture is then drawn on top of the texture holding the terrain information. What I would then do was go through several different shaders. And firstly, I would remove the health from the pixels that overlapped where the damage texture was. And this was based on the material durability and the strength of the attack. Then I would output which materials have been destroyed. So their health is now below zero on a new texture so that I could figure out which materials had been mined. Then I would set all the pixels that have now got a health beneath zero to be fully transparent inside the terrain information. I would then have to go through every single pixel inside that destroyed terrain texture to figure out which materials to add to the player's inventory. And I also added these lovely little particles here. But as you can imagine, using the CPU to go through every single pixel in this image to figure out which material has been destroyed is a terrible, truly horrible idea. And it gets even worse the bigger that the terrain is and the terrain's going to get bigger. So I had to come up with a better solution. And I found these things called atomic counters, where basically you can pass some numbers into the GPU. And then when the shade is running, you can add or subtract to these values. And then when the shade is done, you can read those values back from the GPU. And that's perfect. That's exactly what we want. We can pass in an array of these counters, one for each each different material and then when we destroy one of these materials we can increment its counter and then we know exactly how many of each material we've destroyed and to do this i just followed this tutorial here which was a massive help and i'll leave a link down into the description it even has a section here doing exactly what i wanted to do with an array of counters that are indexed based on the value of a color channel and for the life of me, I could not get it to work at all. Sometimes it would tell me I'd mine 500 million of a resource that didn't even exist. And other times it would tell me I'd mine 500 million of a resource that did exist. And my particle system is not equipped to handle those sorts of numbers. So I went back to the article to see if I could get any clue. Oh, oh, yep. Yeah, that'll probably do it. So if you saw my video on using shaders inside P5.js, you would know that shaders are quite new to me. So I'm still I'm still learning. I'll chalk that one up as a, as a learning experience. So I ditched the atomic counter and I replaced it with something called a shader storage buffer object or an SSBO. And from what I can tell, an SSBO 
and an atomic count are pretty much the same thing, except that with an SSBO, you can pass in more than just an integer. And I think that under the hood, the atomic count has actually used the SSBO, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. Anyway, I set up this SSBO and it literally worked the first time. Looks like pixel-based destructible terrain is back on the menu, boys. Smash that like button if you want to be blessed by the optimization oracle. As you probably saw in some of those last clips, I've also implemented this basic card system for the tools. So at the moment, I've only got two different card types, but in the future, it'll be really simple to add some more. You're also going to get more than three cards per hand, but at the moment, I'm just playing around with just three. Under the hood, there's a deck of cards that you draw from when you arrive at a new asteroid. And when you use them, they get discarded. And then if your deck runs out when you're going to a new asteroid, it shuffles the discard pile and puts it back into your deck. And all of that is pretty much the exact same as a normal deck builder. But unlike a normal deck builder, there's no energy system or anything, which means you can play every single card in your hand. But you only get one hand per asteroid. So you've got to be really careful in how you play these cards to maximize the number of resources that you mine. As you can see, when you hover over a card, it shows a little preview of the area it's going to damage. Also on the card itself, it shows the strength of that damage and what level the card is. And eventually this will show a lot more helpful information. It's also gonna have a little picture at the top, but I haven't got around to that yet. Another thing on the to-do list is a way to actually upgrade these cards. So I'll do that when I do the whole menu system, which is gonna be so much fun. I love GUI programming. Anyway, that's as far as I've got at the moment. This video is getting way too long as well. So thanks for sticking around. I got the game to this point in about a week, but during that week I was isolating from COVID and so I didn't have any social obligations. I mean, I don't have any social obligations now, but I didn't back then either. I'm also back at work, which means unfortunately development is gonna have to slow down. Now there's still a lot to do. I need to come up with a bunch of new cards. I need to generate more interesting asteroids with more resources in them. There's also a lot of visual work that needs to be done. So like the precious resources need to pop on the asteroid and the, the background image is, well, it's there and the players are red line. So all of that sort of stuff needs to be sorted out as well. But this is just the beginning of this game. So if you want to see how it goes, be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell as well so that you can see the next train wreck of a dev vlog when it comes out. Alrighty, see you next time.